Hi there, and welcome to Chinese art or survey of Chinese art A348. In this lecture, we're going to start talking about the Song Dynasty, the beginning of the Song Dynasty after the fall of the Tang, um, and we'll be looking at the Northern Song. That is the um, per, the majority of the period that the Song Dynasty rules is in the northern part of China, and so it's called the Northern Song. They're invaded in the year 1127, and uh, the the Song Dynasty has to flee south, and so then there's a, another. 60 or 70 years of, of, of Song Dynasty rule in the southern part of China, and that's called the Southern Song. It's the same ruling family, it's just that they have geographically relocated. And we're going to start today talking about monumental landscape painting, which emerges in the early part of the Song Dynasty in the 10th and 11th centuries, and really becomes a important category of art and art philosophy in China. Now, in the past few weeks, although we haven't had lectures, you should have been doing some readings where you learn about the emergence of calligraphy and personalized styles of calligraphy uh, and the whole emergence of a new class of what are called literati painters or um, amateur painters, the scholar officials of the court who paint for a hobby uh, as well as then the the um, court painters who are artists, that is visual artists, as a um, uh, a matter of making a living. Uh, these are all important developments that we have been reading about in the last few weeks and then today we're going to look at the development of a particular art philosophy around monumental landscape painting that has its seeds in earlier landscape painting that we've seen developing from really the six dynasties onward, um, but that becomes kind of a, a standalone art form in itself during the Song Dynasty. We're only going to look at a few of the monumental hanging scrolls that were created during this period to um, get an idea of the visual culture of this period and then the kind of um, philosophy behind it. Uh, this is one of the major hand scroll, or excuse me, hanging scrolls of the Song Dynasty by an artist named Li Cheng. And this painting is called Solitary Temple Amid Clearing Peaks. It is from the early part of the Northern Song. It's a late ninth or late 900s um, painting on silk. And as you can see here, it's a very vertically oriented image of um, very towering mountains. And then we've got the hint of fog, basically, right? Um, fog clearing out of valleys, clouds evaporating out of the valleys in between these different mountains. You've got some very tall elongated waterfalls and then nestled into this mon monumental majestic scene of the natural landscape with these craggy peaks with these little cra um, crab claw trees in the foreground. You have a couple of um, man-made structures, bridges, temples, kind of nestled into the grandeur and majesty of of um, nature. And this landscape is a really good example, early example, of the dominant form that we see in the Northern Sung, the monumental landscape of mountains in a hanging scroll format, in a vertical oriented format. These are typically quite large. Um, this one's about five feet tall, and some of them are even larger. The most famous of the, these early paintings of the Northern Song is about seven feet tall, so you can imagine. I mean, it's the kind of thing you'd unroll it, hang it on a, on a strut, and then it would really fill up your whole vision as you're contemplating it. And it was meant to kind of be an experience that would surround you so that you'd be looking at this, this thing, and it would take up your whole vision and give you a kind of mental journey into the picture. Okay, so Li Cheng is actually a um, guy who is from the Tang Dynasty imperial family. When the Tang Dynasty collapsed in 907, um, his fortunes kind of fell, um, you know, with that of his family. And he, he pretty much, um, you know, retreated into his scholar official life then um, because he was no longer able to be part of the um, aristocracy once the Tang Dynasty fell. So Li Cheng <clears throat> turned to painting landscapes, and there's a famous um, saying actually comes from a poet who one of his famous poems I have in the um, in the Song Dynasty uh, weeks, um, a guy named Du Fu who wrote a poem actually much earlier than the the Song Dynasty, but one that appealed to Song Dynasty scholars. Um, 
that says basically in translation, um, dynasties change, you know, the rivers and mountains remain. And that became a kind of philosophy for a lot of scholar officials in China who would be buffeted by the changes in dynasties, you know, their political alliances, if they're, the people they were allied to uh, fell out of power, then of course they would fall out of power. And um, there, there becomes this kind of constant theme in Chinese culture, especially among the literati and among the um, bureaucratic educated classes that you know, the thing that you can depend on is not humankind, it's not nat It's not um, the world of men, it's not power, it's not the affairs of state. What you can rely on and what will never fail you is nature. And this goes back to, remember those Six Dynasties era um, images of the culture heroes, these kind of scholar officials who retreat to the country and spend their time writing poetry and getting drunk, that ideal of the the scholar, the educated, erudite man who's really, you know, he serves the state, but he's above all of that. And what is really important to him is stuff that can't be taken away. Nature, self-cultivation, relaxation, enjoyment of um, the simple life, right? These are things that cannot be taken away by um, changing state imperial fortunes. Um, so this becomes a really important part of Northern Song landscape painting, is this idea that you can rely on nature, and nature is predominant, and nature is kind of above um, the affairs of humankind. There are a couple of other things, too, to note stylistically about the work of an artist like Lee Chung. One of the things he's doing here is he's using ink monochrome. That is, everything in this painting is created by using ink, one kind of ink, um, and a paintbrush, the same brush that would be used to make calligraphy. And so all the different textures, all the different um, densities of color or of, um, of ink, of black versus gray versus light gray versus a wash, um, these are all created using only one pigment. And the interest in these paintings is in creating a feeling of um, visual kind of reality um, that is dependent upon the different textures that are um, different textures, dry brush, wet brush, um, thin ink, or very, very densely saturated ink. Uh, these are all the variations that you use to create um, different textures and a sense of either near or far away, the use of atmospheric perspective. Uh, the, these are paintings also are not meant to be viewed the way that maybe a Western painting of a landscape would be viewed. The, the idea is that you can't in one, a picture is not a window into reality, it's a kind of transliteration of reality. And so you can't look at all of nature at the same time any more than you can look at a painting all at the same time. So you're meant in this picture to let your eye wander and stop at different points in the picture, picture um, to take yourself through the picture from the foreground to the middle ground to the background. Um, this kind of sense of, of different perspectives, this shifting perspective where you're looking at part of the picture from above, part of the picture from straight on, um, that kind of, that kind of sort of experience of the visual experience of this image, very different than a Western landscape that's meant to make you feel as if you're looking through a window into a uh, receding background. Here, there's no attempt at that kind of illusion. It's meant to be a kind of mental journey that you take literally with your eyes. Uh, and so that that's something else that's different about this kind of painting than maybe what you'd be used to seeing in Western oil paintings of, of landscape. And this is typical, this, this shifting perspective is sort of typical. This idea is that what this painter's trying to get at is not just a, a physical illusion, but an idea of the deeper spiritual reality of nature. Remember that Li Chung and other painters here at this time are steeped in not just Buddhist traditions and Confucian traditions, but also Taoist traditions that infuse all of nature with deeper moral, spiritual, and cosmological significance. And that is going to be an aspect of what informs how these painters understand what they're doing when they're making a landscape picture. 
Um, oh, and I think I've got this le linked, um, a zoomable image of this solitary temple amid clearing peaks, which is at the Nelson Atkins, which is a museum in Kansas City that has maybe the best collection of Chinese art outside of China. Uh, you can go to this website, and I've got it linked from um, the Blackboard, so that you can get really fine details of this very large scroll that I'm not able to reproduce in a lecture. So um, make sure that you take some time to actually look at this scroll in some detail. Uh, speaking of detail, so here's a close-up of one of the temples in the soli or of the temple in the solitary temple amid clearing peaks. A couple of things I wanted to point out to you. You can see here how Li Chung has used the brush in very different ways to create the kind of jagged um, axe cut texture, as it's called, of the craggy rocks in the foreground. You have these what are called cr crab claw trees these craggy little crab-shaped claw trees with very, very dark ink. Um, then you have the very fine, thin, very elegant um, linear detail of the temple itself. You've got areas of wash filled in in the background and then areas like this area of plain silk behind the temple that is left blank to suggest the idea of mist rising up from an unseen stream that runs behind that foothill in front of the mountain. Uh, remember, this is all done using one color of ink that's just being varied by um, density and by the dryness or wetness of the brush, by the thinness or thickness of the stroke that's being used um, to create different textures and um, senses of of foreground and background and um, sort of aerial perspective, if you will. Here's another very extreme close-up where you can see that Li Chung has put human figures into this uh, landscape, but they are very, very tiny. And I mean, he's done this with a great degree of detail and characterization. So here in this tea house, you have servants carrying water, you have scholars sitting at tables, you have different classes of people who are intermingling here. I also like this detail because you can really see how with this one color of ink and this one brush he has made the different textures and given you a sense of perspective and depth in this little area of the painting that you're looking at. So these paintings or a painting like this is meant to be a kind of visual exercise which allows you to kind of spend time looking at up close tiny little details and then to pull back and look at the whole thing overall and get a sense of the grandeur of nature uh, and of the universe. Uh, the next painting that we'll look at is Fan Quan's Travelers Amid Streams and Mountains. This is a slightly later painting. This is the one that's about seven feet tall. And this is a painting that is um, known as the Mona Lisa of China. Extremely famous painting in Chinese history. Extremely kind of iconic and representative for people of what it means to, um, to what Chinese art means. Uh, so let's see, um, like I was saying with Li Chung, you've got the same thing going on here. You've got a shifting perspective where you're meant to look at some of this painting from you know above, some of this painting is sort of painted as if it's looking up from below. You have the ax cut brush strokes, you have the different densities, the different textures of um, ink in order, and even just areas of plain silk that are meant to create this feeling of um, atmosphere and mist kind of rising up from the unseen stream behind the foothills there. Um, and the same thing is with Li Chung. This is meant to be a picture that's about more than just a landscape. It's about humans and their relationship to the natural world. It's about the permanence of nature and the impermanence of man. It's about finding meaning and solace in the um, permanence of nature and in some ways people have also said this is probably um, meant to be also a kind of statement of you know everything being right with the world everything in its proper place and in China in the court system of the 11th century this also would bear comparison then uh, in a Confucian context where you've got the relationship between the mountains and the foothills you've got the streams You've got everything in its place. You've got a system of interdependent relationships, much like a Confucian system of interdependent, reciprocal, hierarchical relationships structure the whole society. 
Fan Quan's painting is also interesting because it's one of the first paintings we have in China that is actually signed by its creator. And Fan Quan signed this painting. Uh, this was unknown actually until the 1950s when a student who was working on this painting happened to notice this. It buried among the foliage in the um, painting is the signature of the artist Fan Quan. Very significant that he would choose to sign the painting, but also that he would make his signature small and part of the foliage, not something that dominates the entire painting, not a huge inscription, um, but kind of putting himself into the, um, into the, the, the larger scheme of things. And here I'm just showing you a close-up of that right foreground area where you can see that there are humans included in this painting, but they are in this little mule train that's in the very foreground there. Um, the very, very teeny little, you know, um, series of donkeys with a person uh, herding them, basically walking down this mountain path. Here, this is included because it reminds you of the enormity of nature, the enormity of the the Earth's reciprocal balancing relationships of yin and yang, water and rock, mountains and streams, these, uh, these things kind of dwarfing and encompassing all of human nature uh, or all of humanity, whether it's that mule train, whether it's that teeny little temple that's tucked into the um, upper right of the detail there, um, humankind, small and insignificant compared to the majesty and permanence of the mountains. Oh, and here I'm just showing you, by the way, just so you get a sense of what these artists are looking at. Here, this is um, in the northern part of China, uh, mountain formations not too far away from Beijing. This would give you a sense of what these guys are looking at that they're painting so that you can see that, I mean, the, the kind of bare, craggy face of the rock mountain there with the little um, sprinkling of foliage or trees on the top. This is really what these mountains look like in this part of China. I always think it's very interesting to see that, that these guys have really captured something really quite um, essential about what the landscape actually looks like in this part of the world. Oh, and there's a nice close-up of, the, don of the, the leader of this donkey train, so you can see how teeny tiny that little figure is. I also like this detail because it gives you a sense of the very um, <clears throat> wide varying kinds of strokes that are used to convey tree bark or foliage or dirt or water or rock, um, all done in ink monochrome. Here's a close-up of some of the foliage. So here again, just you can see the difference, the bark, the leaves, uh, every leaf kind of individually observed there, twisting and turning in space. Um, very amazing to me that this can be done all using one color of ink and really one texture or one kind of ink. Um, oh, I should note, by the way, these early silk paintings that you see, they look very dark golden in the background with the ink, um, black and gray ink in the foreground. It's important to remember that when these paintings were made, the silk would have been a kind of pure creamy white. And the reason that they look so dark and um, golden now is because they have oxidized over time. It's hard to recapture what these must have looked like before the silk was discolored when you could have even gotten a better sense of the modulation of the ink washes um, on that creamy silk background. So that's a little bit unfortunate, but these paintings are ancient. They're a thousand years old now, basically. So um, we're lucky to have them at all. I know that um, Travelers, or, or Fan Quan's, um, Fan Quan's painting, actually, it's in the National Palace Museum in Taipei, and um, it is never, I mean, it's almost never brought out. It's been, in, it's been carefully controlled storage for the last 40 years or so, and I think it's been out on display like once or maybe twice because they really want to keep it from deteriorating by exposure to light or the atmosphere or, you know, having too many visitors in a room with it becoming too humid, things like that. Uh, and there's just a very teeny tiny, the bottom right hand of the scroll, you can see Fan Quan's signature, two characters there tucked in amid the leaves. Um, very, very small little signature. Again, kind of putting him into the context of the larger nature around him. 
And here's some details of travelers amid streams and mountains, which I really like because here again, close up, you can really see the ax cut texture, the areas of ink wash, the areas that have been left blank in order to convey um, the different, the different looks, the different visual characteristics of rock and water and tree and leaf. And the other um, early Northern Sung painting that is a monumental hanging scroll painting that encapsulates some of these ideas about the importance of the monumental landscape as not only kind of the permanence of nature versus the impermanence of man, also if you want to compare society to nature, the, the kind of um, hierarchical relationship between mountain and foothill um, between emperor and subject or, or what have you, as well as the varying Taoist and Confucian and um, Buddhist ideas that are so, by this time, getting really sort of intertwined in Chinese culture. This is the last of these major monumental um, hanging scrolls that we'll look at. This is Guo Xi's Early Spring, and it's precisely dated. He signed it um, and dated it to 1072. And... Uh, We we know the most about Guo Xi. He's the one who wrote the landscape treatises that I've had you read about the the monumental landscape and the importance of landscape. Um, Guo Xi is important because he was a major painter in the early Imperial Academy, and he is a guy who taught other painters how to paint. Um, Guo Xi called his shifting perspectives on one one image of landscape, which you can really see clearly here. You've got shifting perspectives from this kind of distant looking up at the faraway um, mountain peaks to kind of looking down at the foothills and the waterfall in the foreground. This sense that you have to kind of move through a landscape and that you can't focus on the whole thing at one time. You have to kind of look, you know, here, look there, kind of travel through the landscape. Um, and here's what he says about why, why paint landscapes, okay? A virtuous man takes delight in landscapes, so that in a rustic retreat he may nourish his nature. Amid the carefree play of streams and rocks, he may take delight, that he might constantly meet in the country fishermen, woodcutters, and hermits, and see the soaring of cranes and hear the crying of monkeys. The din of the dusty world and the locked inness of human habitations are what human nature habitually abhors. On the contrary, haze, mist, and the haunting spirits of the mountains are what human nature seeks and yet can rarely find. So that's what he's painting here. Um, forget about the locked inness, the kind of daily grind of being part of human society. Humans hate that. What they want is nature. What they want is the the haze, the mist, the mysticality, the haunting spirits of the mountains, what human nature seeks. He seeks rustic simplicity. He seeks the cry of cranes. He seeks the chatter of monkeys. He seeks woodcutters, hermits, fishermen, simple folk. This is what, and of course, you know, I mean, this is a common kind of human thing. I find this is really true in 19th century America, too. People who live in cities always think that people who live out in the country have it much easier. I think it's because people who live in cities have never worked on farms, and they don't realize how arduous and um, kind of, you know, constant life in the country can be, right? Uh, but there's this kind of romantic vision of, well, if I was just a woodcutter or a fisherman, it, life would be so much easier. I'd be in tune with nature. I'd be out, you know, among the, the, the um, simple folk. I mean, it wouldn't be all this hubbub all the time, right? And that's kind of what Guo Xi is saying in the 11th century here. And that's why he turns to painting landscapes. And that's why the court liked these beautiful landscape paintings at that time. Partly the idea of permanence, partly the idea of um, Taoist yin and yang, partly the idea that this is an escape from the daily grind of life uh, in the sophisticated court. And Guo Xi's paintings uh, have a couple of different strokes that get their own nicknames. So um, he continues with the crab claw trees that we saw with Li Chung. 
he also has a, um, he calls his shifting perspective the angle of totality, okay? With the idea is that you don't have to be fixed in one spot looking in a landscape painting to look at the whole landscape from one perspective. You look at it from multiple perspectives, from the total angle, the angle of totality. Um, strokes that are particular to his style include the devil's face texture stroke, which is the stroke that you see on the large rock forms. I love that name, the devil's devil's face texture stroke and the cloud resembling rocks. One thing that you find throughout all of Chinese history is that famous painters and calligraphers get um, through history get nicknames for particular kinds of brush strokes that they're known for. And in Guo Xi's case, um, that he becomes known for the devil's face texture rocks, which you can see there in the foreground of um, early spring here. Um, just as Li Chung had been known for the crab claw trees, and you can see here that Guo Xi is following in the Li Chung tradition. Um, uh, and in fact, the, this kind of landscape where you have these craggy rocks and the crab claw trees actually gets known as the um, Li Guo style of landscape painting. And here's another northern China landscape. I wanted to show you this um, image because, again, it gives you a sense of where these where these kinds of approaches to landscape are coming from with these um, blank areas of silk that are the representing um, waterfalls and things like that and then these crab claw trees and these craggy mountains. There's another view of Guo Xi's early spring there you can see those waterfalls in the right half of the painting where really he's just left some areas of silk completely blank to um, indicate the idea of rushing water coming down on the rocks and imagine if this silk was not discolored if it was still creamy white how stark that would be just like when you look at it in a photograph now. Here's some nice close-up views there you can see in the foreground some of those devil's face texture rocks and the crab claw trees and then look at that you've got on that little spit of land there in the midground you've got a couple of fishermen sitting on the bank there on the left is another view a view into the hazy distance remember uh, in Guo Xi's comments on landscape one of the things he says is you know human beings long for the hazy mist of a mountain landscape this kind of mysterious um, uh, middle distance where you can't really see what's going on right and then I like to here on the, the right you can see more of these waterfalls that are essentially um, areas of the silk that have been left blank. And again, you know, just to, it's another ink monochrome painting where all of the texture, all of the atmosphere, all of the, the variation in, in color really comes from the deft use of the brush and of the ink. And there's another view of waterfalls, so just again to kind of get you to see where, although these Chinese painters in the Northern Song are not interested in a one-to-one -one correspondence to visual reality that's illusionistic, they are interested in capturing some essence of what these places look like, and I think they do it very well. Uh, and finally then, Guo Xi's um, landscape scroll, Old Trees Level Distance, and Old Trees Level Distance is a horizontal format. It's a hand scroll as opposed to a hanging scroll, but it is still a Guo Xi landscape where he's trying to capture a kind of shifting perspective um, It's uh, on the landscape and to give an experience of a landscape. Uh, and in particular, this kind of hazy, misty landscape that he talks about being this kind of, you know, ideal um, escape and retreat. Now, one thing to remember, and you've been reading up on, I hope you've been reading up not only on calligraphy, but also on the different formats of Chinese painting. Unlike a, a hanging scroll, which would be taken out and hung up on a frame for viewing, not for um, permanent viewing, but, you know, taken out by someone who would appreciate it, a scholar, an emperor, whatever, whatever hung up, looked at, contemplated, tea drunk or wine drunk, and people talk about the painting, and then it gets rolled up and put away. A hand scroll also is viewed in a time-limited format. It's a horizontal format, and it unrolls um, basically so that you're reading from right to left through the landscape. And you have to think of having a long horizontal table. You'd set the scroll down, you'd unroll it just enough 
uh, just basically an arm's length and you would look at the section of the scroll and then after you had spent some time on that section of the scroll you would roll it unroll it to the left and roll it up on the right so that you'd move almost cinematically through the painting and here with Guo Xi's Old Trees and Level Distance, that's really what you're meant to do. You're meant to sit down and roll your way or scroll your way through the hand scroll, stopping to look at different vistas so that you can almost see here in this um, overall shot of the, the scroll where there would be two different stopping points. You Starting from the right here, right, you'd unroll to about where that, that very large... Um, seal is at the top of the painting and you'd have that little vista of a couple of crab claw trees in the foreground, some fishermen on the river, and then some misty hazy mountains in the background. So that would be one vista. After you'd looked at that, you'd roll it up from the right, you'd unroll to the left, and then you'd have really from that large seal to the, the very left side of the painting another little vista, some some devil's texture um, devil's face texture rocks in the foreground, some crab claw trees, and a little um, temple there tucked into the background with some people on a bridge going across the river. And that would be another vista that you would stop and look at and travel through with your eyes and contemplate. Level distance is a different perspectival technique in Chinese painting. So that's a, a level distance is basically a view across a broad lowland expanse. And you can really see that, especially the right hand side of this painting. It's a broad, um, low kind of um, expansive view of a landscape, as opposed to the angle of totality, that shifting perspective you see in early spring. Guoxi describes his technique in one of his painting treatises. He says, after the outlines are made by clear dark ink strokes, use ink wash mixed with blue to retrace these outlines repeatedly so that even if the ink outlines are clear, they appear always as if they had just come out of the mist and dew, which you can really see here, especially in the background where you can see the lines of these mountains kind of emerging out of a very, very foggy, hazy mist in the, um, in the foreground area. And there's a nice view of the first half of, um, of uh, old trees level distance so that you can get a better sense of the level of detail that he's included here. And then there's the second half of old trees level distance. So again, this is the so-called um, level distance formula or level distance um, kind of perspective as opposed to the, sh the angle of totality. And finally, here's another um, Northern Song horizontal scroll as opposed to hanging scroll by another um, um, important landscape painter, Xu Daoning, uh, from the 11th century. So Fisherman's Evening Song. Here again, these court painters of this period really start to romanticize the idea not only of nature itself, but then of the people who live out in nature. And what you can see is, although the ma majority of the visual focus of this painting is a level distance view of craggy peaks in a broad expanse and you have the craggy peaks in the foreground being delineated more clearly and more darkly than the peaks in the background that are somewhat more faint and are obscured by a haze. Um, that is a that is a classic example of what is called level distance technique in China. It's similar to atmospheric perspective in the West where things that are closer are in more um, detail and are more focused and things that are in the distance are hazier and in, in Western atmospheric perspective, bluer. Um, but in, in Xu Daoning, this is all ink monochrome. So you've got just the, the varying ink textures to make that same kind of visual um, impact.